This is Star Talk Cosmic Queries Edition. Today, I got Josh Clark in the house, and you know him from Stuff You Should Know and a newly emergent podcast called The End of the World. Josh, welcome to Star Talk. Thank you very much for having me here. I mean, like, I'm really thrilled to be sitting here. Right excellent, now. excellent. And my co host, Chuck Nice. Hey, hey. How are you, Neil? Welcome, nice. welcome. Nice. And so I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson. So, Josh, just stuff you should know, hugely popular. Yeah, you know, we just hit 1 billion downloads. Wow. We've been around for oh, almost he, 11 he, he, years. <laughs> wow. and I think, from what, what we understand, we're the first podcast to ever hit a billion downloads. So now we have to teach you how to say that. Okay, all right. You had. A billion. <laughs> <Right>? yeah. <laughs> Eventually, we'll get billions and billions. billions and yeah, yeah, when you have two billions, then we'll teach you to say billions and billions. Yeah, I can't wait. Well, congratulations Thank on that. Thank you very much. Excellent, yeah. excellent. So that's a testament to not only how good the show is, but also that you've tapped into the fact that people still want to learn. Mm -hmm, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, when we started doing it um, in 2008... Like learning was actually popular. I don't know if you remember back then, but like <laughs> being smart and geeky was right. super cool. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of changed a little bit, a little bit. recently. But um, overall, I, I think the fact that we are still popular shows that there always has been and always will be people who want to keep learning. People who leave college and they're like, well, wait a minute, that was pretty cool. Yeah, lifelong learners. Right, exactly. Right. And, and they definitely are a fan base. And we, there's a lot of them out there, we can we can tell you. And you weren't satisfied with just stuff you should know. Now you got to end the world. Right. right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Chuck, we, we solicited uh, questions from our fan base, our, yes. our social media platform, Indeed who knew Josh was coming on the show. Yeah. And so they, they, came, they came at us. They did indeed. And, of course, we... Uh, we um, Glean these questions from every Star Talk incarnation on the interwebs, and uh, we always start with a Patreon patron because you're so crass. Well, I am indeed. Uh, so I have crass. no shame, Neil. Oh, man, yes, that man. and uh, well, you know the Patreon patrons give us money, and so therefore we give them uh, they we, get give, the we give first. them precedent <laughs> okay. and, and 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 privilege because quite you know we're look, look we're like we're like your government people. <laughs> <laughs> we're like your government. Wow. God, do I really want to start off on such a heavy note? Do Why it. not? Let's do it. do it. This is Luke Meadows from uh, uh, Patreon. He says... Uh, Luke Meadows, that sounds like a soap opera name. It does, kind of. Luke Meadows. <laughs> Ooh, you know what? That's kind of cool. <laughs> yes, is. Luke, exactly. Luke Meadows. Doctor Luke Do Meadows. Excuse me. Oh, yeah. Of course, yeah. Dr. Luke Meadows. Doctor, will the I ever dance doctor. again? <laughs> <laughs> the handsome doctor. Only with me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right, here you go. What does Josh and Neil think is our biggest existential risk? Wow, we're starting off with like, bam. Let's do it. Like heaviest bat in the rack. Yeah. What is our biggest existential risk? You got a podcast with the name End of the World. Go for it. Okay, all right. Um, uh, from what I found, the uh, across the board, everybody who thinks about existential risks and, and warns other people about existential risks um, say that, AI is probably our biggest existential risk. Mm. And the reason, let me follow up with an explanation. Okay. Um, the reason why is because we are putting onto the table right now the pieces for a machine to become super intelligent, right? It's out there. It's possible. Um, it's not necessarily right there, but it's, it's possible, right? The problem is, is we haven't figured out how to uh, create what's called friendliness, into an AI. So in or AI, human beings. Right, right. Humans. That's true. But that's humans a, as well. No, that's a really good point though, right? Like how we don't even know how to define like morality and friendliness. And, and as far as AI goes, um, friendliness in an AI is an AI that uh, cares about humans as much as a machine can care. Mm. It takes so friendliness account, in AI is just an AI that doesn't kill you. Basically, I think that would count as a friendly AI. Right, Basically, yeah. but the, the, the problem is the pitfall with AI as an existential risk is we make this assumption that if an AI became super intelligent, uh, friendliness or, would be an emergent property of that super intelligence. That is not necessarily true. Or that the friendliness that we instill into that AI mm -hmm. would supersede the emergent property mm -hmm. of overcoming friendliness right. in lieu of you guys... You guys got to go. Right. Like, you guys are the problem. I've seen so. what you do to livestock. Right. I'm not exactly. very happy about yeah. that. Yeah. So, yeah. humans are yeah, virus. Really 
<laughs> that was good. Wait, who was that? Wait, that that's that's agent. Hold on, agent. Um, ooh, ooh, ooh. Mr. Na- Anderson. They're all named Smith. Smith. <laughs> How could you not get the I right name? Agent, agent Smith. Smith. <laughs> They're Thank all Smith. You. They're all Smith. <laughs> right, Mr. Anderson. My name. Is Neo? Yes. Okay. Anyway. Stella. <laughs> that was a different. That was a play. Oh, okay. I think. Yeah. No, that was the end of the Matrix Four. <laughs> <laughs> Stella. Stella. <laughs> so, uh, so you just worried, based on the, the the sum of experts you've spoken to. Yeah. You agree that this. I is do the actually. They've convinced me. Um, the more I looked into it, and this is one of those things. It's really tough to just kind of get across. You know, a, a brief sketch of the actual existential threat that artificial intelligence poses. And I, I dedicated a whole episode to it in the end of the world. Um, but when you start to dig into it, you realize like, oh, wait, this is really like it's possible that this could happen. Mm-hmm. And we, while we're, we're improving by leaps and bounds, especially ever since we started creating um, – neural nets that could learn on their own, just just feeding them information, like just basically sitting them in front of YouTube and say, go learn what makes a cat picture a cat picture, right? Um, Once we started doing that, our AI research just shot off like a a rocket, right? It was probably the most watershed moment in the history of artificial intelligence, and it happened very quietly about 2006. So we're doing really well with AI development. We're doing terribly with figuring out friendliness. And granted, the AI field has taken this seriously. There are AI researchers who are legitimate AI researchers who are working on figuring out friendliness in parallel to figuring out machine intelligence, but it's it's not keeping up. And this right here is a very dangerous... So here's the thing. So I had a different answer from you Okay. about our greatest existential risk. Okay. But I like your answer better. Oh, wow. Thank you. Than the answer I was going to give. I, well, I think well, now I'd you still like to hear it anyway. Oh, oh, just an asteroid will render every one of us extinct, including the AI. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> <laughs> asteroid wins again! So, if yeah, so. Asteroid basically wins every oh contest. Goodness. I can so, see that. No, so here's it's the like, thing. It's like the God mode in a video game. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's what we have to do then. I have a hybrid solution here. Okay. We invent the AI mm-hmm. that wants to take us out, and you say, no, you have to figure out a way to deflect the asteroid. Mm-hmm. Because that's going to take us all out. And while it's busy doing get, that, get we kill it. will get completely distracted right. by solving the asteroid problem. And then Because we we're not it. its biggest threat. When do we kill it? Oh, well, so we, that, right when it's looking up, then you unplug them all. <laughs> <laughs> Sneak up behind it with a screwdriver. Right. <laughs> Bang I, it never, I never saw that coming. <laughs> <laughs> so so can I tell you what, what, what sold me over to, to what you said? Okay. It was not the, and none, none of the arguments you gave. A different argument, but they all come together. Okay, it was I was sure. It, here, you, you can you can abstract the problem into a simple question, right? If you put AI in a box, <clears throat> will it ever get out of the box? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I'm locking you in the box because I think you're dangerous. Okay. Can the AI get out of the box? That's a, that's very interesting. Uh, so yeah, you can just abstract it right. to You've that got simple to abstract question. It to that, that's very okay? interesting. Go ahead and. Listening to an AI program, another podcast, mm-hmm. Podcast Universe with Sam Harris, mm-hmm. I said, my gosh, it gets out every time. Mm-hmm. What's in the box? Because before <laughs> then, I'm thinking, look, this is America. AI gets out of hand. I'm going, you shoot it. You're right. Okay? <laughs> I, you know, this is like, like who's the, in, in um, Beverly Hillbillies? Just, you just shoot it. Yeah. Uh, uh, my, my, uh, any Jan, of them. Jan any Trampet, of them. Any of them. <laughs> right. The any of them. It's even Ellie Mae. <laughs> Ellie Mae. <laughs> oh, Grandma, everybody's yeah, everybody got a gun. Right. Okay. So I can just shoot it. Yeah. And I, no, it doesn't work that way. Right. Because AI is in the box. I'm never letting you out. And the AI will convince you to let it out. Right. right. If it's smarter than you, that's the job. It, that, that's, that's its job. That's what. It, right. The fact that it's smarter mm-hmm. means it will. So it, here's I'm making up this conversation, but this is the simplest of conversation. I'm not letting you out, um, but I want to get out. No, I'm not letting you. Out. Well, I've just done some calculations, and I have found a cure for the disease that your your mother has. Mm-hmm. Right. But I can't do anything about it in here. You Not have to let here. me out to do that. That'll oh. get the clampets every time. <laughs> <laughs> Ma, I told you to shoot that bomb. <laughs> so I say, wow. <laughs> and it can save everyone in the world? Yeah. 
and now it's and out. It gets out. It right. gets out. That's exactly right. Or um, any any of the, uh, the the locks that we've put around it, any of the the, um, the protocols we've built to keep it in place. I think as you were about to say, it's super intelligent. So right. by definition, it's right. smarter than basically all of us combined. Right. It's and like saying it's like saying um uh, it's like a <laughs> it's like a dog uh-huh. believing it can lock you in a room. <laughs> right. Forever. Right. It's like, no, you say, Oh, I just bought a, you know, fourteen ounce T-bone steak. Mm-hmm. Do you want it for dinner? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I have to go prepare it. Then they open the door, I get out right. of the door. Yeah. Right. Right. And better than that, better than that, I think, okay, you're going to have to forgive me because you had a, 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 um, <clears throat> you had a colleague on and he's a teacher and he might have been one of your teachers that we talked to. And one of his um, methods for getting um, students to learn is you give them um, the same problem that some other astrophysicist may have uh, uh, faced and then as they solve it, that's how they learn, as opposed to teaching them what that astrophysicist already discovered. Mm. You let them make the discovery. Mm-hmm. So if this thing is so smart, it would literally have the ability to just whatever we design to go back to square one yeah, yeah. and redesign it on its own right. and say, well, now here's the next phase. That's right. how I get out of it. Right. Well, that's that's one of the, the emerging threats is um, AI, machine learning, that can write code. Like uh, I think uh, some Harvard researchers trained um, a, a, a deep learning algorithm to write code. I had anything with the word deep in it, it to code. Deep learning, deep this, right. deep impact. It sounds Except menacing, deep right? Impact. It's what? Except deep impact because Morgan Freeman is delightful. As the president of the United States. Absolutely. Yeah. Did the asteroid win in that one? I never saw it. It it tied. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it was a tie. We'll call it. It, it was draw. a tie. Well, it took out New York City. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's a but, big one. But civilization. Big win for California. Civilization <laughs> endured. Civilization. civilization that's what matters. Okay. So, so then that asteroid was not an existential risk. Well, well it was, except we split it into two. Uh huh. And the big piece went away. It and the got little New piece York in the end. In the end of the movie. No, right? no, no. Well, you have to destroy New York because it's a movie. But, they, <laughs> but they did it right. Rather than, unlike in Armageddon. Uh huh where the asteroid pieces had GPS locators and hit monuments. Mm-hmm. <laughs> One so decapitated cool. the Chrysler building. Did it really? Okay. And hit the clock, continued through the Chrysler building, went in the front door of Grand Central Terminal, <laughs> and hit the clock in the middle of the floor. Right. Okay. So, That's the opening sequence. Yes. Okay. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Okay. You remember that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we got this. Another one came from over New Jersey and hit the World Trade Center. Okay. That's Aiming right. for our... Our stuff. All right. So Deep Impact had science advisors. Okay. Because because Armageddon with Bruce Willis mm-hmm. violates more known laws of physics per minute than any other movie ever made. <laughs> okay. That's pretty funny. Just so you know. Okay? Even more than, than Gravity? No, no. That one was cool. That was at least tried. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. That one tried. Yeah. But thanks for remembering my, <laughs> my gravity tirade. But do we only get one question in this segment? Well, listen, this has been I'm, I'm listening. <laughs> the end of the world. Every time I'm still entertained on one question, <laughs> we're doing a great job. The end of the world. <laughs> See, we can fit in one short one. Okay. okay. All right. Let me, let me uh, let's go with Will J, our Patreon patron who says this. What one or two skills would you learn now to be useful and productive in a post apocalyptic world? That is, of course, if we survive the event. So I got one ready. Skill. Ready? Go ahead. I would learn how to break into a hardware store. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a very good one. Yeah. The, the, nothing more valuable in an apocalypse than the contents of a hardware store. Uh, or a towel. Don't forget your towel, too. <laughs> a towel? That's a, that's a hitchhiker's guide reference. Oh, excuse yeah. me. Yeah. Ooh, ooh. I you just need got, to have your towel. I just got hitchhiked. You need, <laughs> to, uh, you need to be able to, to break into a hardware store. My, my answer would be learning how to collect canned food. That would be mine. That's a good That's one. that movie, The Boy and His Dog. I never saw that, the Don Johnson one. Yeah, Don Johnson. Yeah, yeah. I, the dog was intelligent, and but the dog would help. Don Johnson. It, it's apocalyptic Earth, okay. And it's a boy and his dog, the only ones alive on Earth's surface, as far as they know. And Don Johnson, he's like a teenager in this movie. Okay. Right? Uh, he's literally a teenager as an actor, and he's playing a young mm-hmm. kid, boy and his dog. Oh, okay. So, uh, the dog helps him find food, but the food is all canned, and the dog can't get into the can. So he opens the cans and they both eat. Oh, so it's a buddy comedy. It's, it's, it's a <laughs> <laughs> and so they both 
and the dog, I think it communicates telepathically to him or something. Uh -huh. wow. It's an intelligent dog. Is right? it possible Don Johnson's just nuts in that movie? And that the dog no, 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 no. It turns no, out then it'd be a documentary. There, it, it turns out there is. <laughs> stop. It poor, turns poor out. DJ. I know. In this movie, civilization still exists, but they all went underground. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, and he learns this, and it turns out when they go underground, all the men become sterile. Okay. So all the women, when they want to propagate the species, have to get sperm from only people, men who are above ground. From Don Johnson. From basically from Don Johnson. Is it a sexy movie? No, not really. Oh, okay. No, no. Does it it's come more on, just perfunctory. Does it come on Cinemax at three a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Skinemax? Yeah, no. no, no. All right. So, uh, so Chuck, what would you, what would you be your one thing you would take with you? Oh you touch your skill. One skill. Oh. It would be this: being funny, because everybody loves that. <laughs> I'd be like, dude, you know, get, get somebody laughing. And they'd be like, ha, ha, ha. I'm like, yeah, can we break into this um, hardware store? So, and one other thing. There's one more skill you have to have. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt know physics. All right. Okay. If you don't know physics, just move back into the cave. It's, it's, it's kind of a superpower. Here's the, some, here's the reason why I thought about that. Recently, I was asked to review a book written by some MIT physicists and mm -hmm. engineers. Okay. And it's called The Physics of Energy. The it, Physics of Energy. It just came out. Here My God, that, oh. that looks like oh. a textbook. Yeah, that's oh. heavy. Oh. It is kind of a textbook. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's based on courses they taught. All right. Okay? The Physics of Energy, Robert Jaffe, Washington Taylor. And so I actually blurbed the book. <laughs> <laughs> Even books like this can get blurbs, okay? I couldn't put it down. There it goes. You ready? <laughs> yeah. The page turner. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here if it goes. You buy one textbook this year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here it is. This, uh, this is it. Ready? Okay, go ahead. If your task was to jumpstart civilization, but had access to only one book, then the physics of energy would be your choice. Wow. Nice. Professors Taylor and Jaffe have written a comprehensive, thorough, and relevant treatise. It's an energizing read as a standalone book, but it should also be a course offered at every college, lest we mismanage our collective role as shepherds of our energy-hungry, energy-dependent civilization. Sweet. Book drop. Nice. <laughs> now, does, so, that, so does that if, blurb have anything to do with the with the check that I see sitting on this table here from Taylor and Jack? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. That was just to cover postage. Oh, okay, right. gotcha. No. Um, so uh, the point is, you don't want to have to wait for another Isaac Newton to be born mm -hmm. to discover the physics, and then you want to you want to start where you left off. True. And so that's what this book would do. Cool. That was a really good answer. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Better than the towel, I think. For I, sure. I don't mean. I don't <laughs> mean to, canned food. Thing. I don't mean to besmirch. No, it's all right. You know, it Douglas Adams right. here, but it was a jokey answer at best. <laughs> so, well, we just end that segment. We're going to come back to more. Cosmic Queries on the End of the World as we know it. We're back on Star Talk. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. Today's special Cosmic Queries edition on the ends of the world. And we've got Josh Clark with us. Josh. Hey. Welcome. Thank you very much. You're the, the stuff you should know guy. Yes, that's right. With a new podcast, Ends of the World. Yeah, The End of the World with Josh Clark. Appropriately, um, and you really want to associate your name with that concept. <laughs> yeah, okay. I like it. You're kind of like the Tyler Perry of science podcast. Pretty much. Yeah, that's what I was going for. And actually. listen, it's a smart thing to do. <laughs> Everyone who worked on it, I made sign a, a contract that said they would not look me in the eye during production. <laughs> so that's what I was going for. for sure. Very nice. But it's uh, it's all about existential risks, and it's largely based on the work of a guy named Nick Bostrom, yeah. who is a no, philosopher yeah. out of o Oxford. Oxford, yeah. Who's um, basically been warning people about existential risks for twenty years and has really kind of given us our understanding of what existential risks are and why they're different and why they're worth paying attention to. I said I know him. I know his work. I've, I'm not, I've not met him, yeah. but I've referenced his work many times in my talks. I got to speak to him a few times for the podcast, like three times. And on the third time, his um, his assistant was like, you know, Dr. Bostrom like puts every request for um, like a media appearance or an interview or a project or whatever through a cost benefit analysis. And I made it through that grinder like three times. Wow. And I felt pretty good about that. Chuck, and then do I you realized think the billion downloads has something to do with that? I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't fall on it. I just came in. I'm just know, saying. Or whatever, I, I think the billion, that, that, that helps. that's a heavy number. Yeah, but the right. thing, I, I think the reason why he, he was speaking to me so frequently or so willing to talk to me about the same thing three times 
is um, because, you know, he was talking through me. He was trying to reach more people. And, mm-hmm. and that kind of brought me back down to size a little bit after I realized that. That's a good thing, though. I mean, you know, it's, it's worthwhile. Yeah. yeah. So, Chuck, let's get some more questions. Let's do mm-hmm. it. Any more Patreons? <clears throat> no, but I... Oh, God, here it is. So this is Phil Vader 23 from Instagram. Somewhat rhetorical, but I'm, 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 I'm interested. I think I know why he asked. If the world ended, uh, would the human race end? And I'll say vice versa. There, there are a lot of people who feel like that this is like we're it. Who, you know what I mean? Like if we end, that is the end. Mm-hmm. Like so if the world ended, would the human race end? And if the human race ends, we, we know the world wouldn't end. But Earth is going to be here with or without us. Yeah. Earth is here before, during, and after asteroid strikes. It's here before, during, and after viral uh, um, viral attacks. So we are a blip in the history of the Earth. Mm -hmm. So when people say, oh, save Earth, they usually mean save Mm -hmm. ourselves on Earth. In almost every case somebody says save Earth, that's implicitly what they mean, save humans on Earth. Mm -hmm. They might say, oh, save the other animals. They might say that. But they don't mean it. Not, <laughs> <laughs> no, that what they mean is w- what we are doing is affecting other animals, mm-hmm. and ultimately that <clears throat> might affect us because we're in an we're, we're in an ecosystem that has balance and, and interconnectivity. Mm-hmm. So it's the short sightedness of decisions we make. I, 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 let me not call it short sighted. Let me say not fully researched. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, because I think people think they're doing what's okay, right? Mm-hmm. They thought, let's make a smokestack and pl- pump smoke into the air right. so that it goes into the air high above you rather than at ground level. That's better, right? And no one is thinking, well, this is still in the air and it's wrapping around the earth. You know, So air pollution was not imagined that it would ever be a worldwide problem. right? And so we had to learn that. Yeah. And when we did, we made great progress, yeah. right? I mean, air is cleaner than it's ever been. Right. All around the world. Thank you, Al Gore. <laughs> he, invented, he invented clean air. <laughs> right. So, yeah, this end of the earth thing. Uh, do you talk much about the end of the earth? I do. It was, it's a, it's a, a big point that I make that um, if, we, if we screw up and we like wipe ourselves out, whether it's through AI or some uh, biotech accident or um, maybe uh, something going awry with nanotech or a physics experiment even potentially, um, if we do this, he's trying to drag my people into. The <laughs> we, I was, heard that. I was waiting for you know global thermal nuclear. Yeah, I heard that. He's trying to blame physics. Right. I thought I would get out of that one. But you know, we, but uh, no. I considered it, but then I decided no. Mm-hmm. Um, but if we, if we, if the worst comes and we slip up and we wipe ourselves out, life would almost almost certainly go on because it has so many times before we've been through at least five that we know of mass extinctions big ones too i think the uh, ordovician one i can't remember how long ago it was it was very very ancient but they're, they're starting to think that a gamma ray burst basically sterilized earth came that close to just killing all life on earth and it still couldn't a gamma ray burst hit earth and life still hung on, hung on after the asteroid wiped out the dinosaurs and a lot of other species. Life will probably keep going. I would bet just about anything on it. So, yeah, there will be life after after we go, if we go. If we go to us, the world will have ended. So it is kind of moot in that respect. Hmm. Um, so one thing about the gamma ray burst mm-hmm. is that was invoked after no one could find any other reason for how that many how much life could go extinct. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's plausible. Right. We have them in the universe. Yeah. Usually they're pointing in some other direction. Mm-hmm. Or if they point towards us, they're very far away. Mm-hmm. Right. So the question is, in the statistics of this, could you have one that's nearby that points oh, straight at us? And if it does, these are high energy <laughs> particles, high energy light, mm-hmm. and it first takes out the ozone layer. Right. The ozone protects you until there's no ozone. Right. But it keeps coming. So it's like the first line of defense mm-hmm. that is now all massacred. Mm. Now it keeps going, makes it all the way down to Earth's surface. Mm-hmm. And those are high energy particles that is, is incompatible with the large molecules that we call biology. Nice. <laughs> so it just breaks apart your molecules right. and it kills everything. It'll kill everything. If you're in a cave, you'll survive. But you probably eat things that depended on things that died on Earth's surface. Right. So, so would you survive even with the atmosphere burned away? 
Or the ozone layer? No, no, the ozone. Away? Yeah, would take out the ozone. So you'd have to go to places where you'd still be protected oh, okay. by, by from the ozone, which would be underground. Underground. Yeah. You would really like episode four, which is about natural risks, including gamma ray bursts. And in the end, you'd be very proud. I, I conclude that they are quite rare and probably not going to happen. Yeah, rare enough so that really you should like do things like buckle your seatbelt. Right. <laughs> There's ah, other, That's more very good advice. <laughs> but but you can take care of both. You can take care of immediate threats like dying in a car crash while you're simultaneously thinking about more remote, larger yeah. threats as well. And but I think, in proportion, you do that in a in a balanced way. Sure, yes. sure. Yeah. That is my new phrase now, just for when I'm going to have reckless abandon, just gamma life. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yep. Yeah, but to Josh's point, you, if you take out 90% of the life and 10% survives, what you've done is pry open ecological niches mm -hmm. that where the 10% of the life that remains can run. Now to just run and fill to that. just run fill that. Well, you right? can, yeah, you can make a pretty good um, case that if we are wiped out, we would leave the biggest ecological niche of all mm -hmm. currently on Earth. Have you seen the book Life After Man? I, I saw like the special on out like discovery or science. Well, maybe they made that like after that. the book. Yeah, they did, right? Right. Oh, so, right. so I thought you were talking about a lifetime special that I. Saw. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. you no, know, Christmas in life. After <laughs> right. Right. So if we, so who do we keep trying to kill that lives with us? That like the mice and rats, right? Right. So if we're out of the way, what sets the upper size <laughs> of a mouse or a rat? It's that it can f escape from being killed by us sure. by going to a pipe or a hole. If we're not there, there's nothing to stop the growth of rodents. Which is like, what's the name of the, the capybara? Afro that's it. What's the, that again? South America. The South capybara. America. That's it's right. The rodent that was this big. It's a river mm -hmm. river rodent. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. There's nothing to stop it. So then they would just run the world. Nice. Right. So, but but. They'd have museums yeah. with <laughs> right. human skeletons. With Teddy right. Roosevelt stuffed in it. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so there, there would also be nothing stopping the capybaras or the giant rodents from also gaining intelligence. It's possible that, that we like to think of ourselves as, as the only intelligent life on Earth, and that's just patently untrue. Right. We just have to expand our definition of intelligence. So perhaps we're the current endpoint in the evolution of intelligent life on Earth. But if we're gone, that doesn't mean that that evolution of intelligence is just going to cease as well. So maybe a million years or 50 million years or 100 million years from now, the capybaras will be like exploring the, the galaxy or the universe. But that presumes that intelligent impro intelligence improves your survival. I, it doesn't? That's a very big assumption. I, but that is an look assumption the, I would Look at the cockroach, make. it's doing just fine. Mm. Without any kind of brain that we would okay, praise. that's true, that's true. But you can also demonstrate They're that if we though, those cockroaches. if we take our intelligence, the cockroaches. But Chuck, Chuck, I don't know what you think when you see a roach. Right. But when I see a roach, I'm really not thinking that's an intelligent. <laughs> I'm really not thinking that. I'm sorry. Well, you're not as dumb as me. <laughs> 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 no, you can be so intelligent that you have devised ways of destroying your own genetic lineage. That is the entire point of the podcast that I made, The End of the World with Josh Clark, that we could possibly have become so intelligent that we might accidentally wipe ourselves out with that intelligence. This is my point. So therefore, uh, an intelligent capybara mm -hmm. might not be where evolution takes it. Right, okay, so... Let's say that that is that that we're following not a, a predetermined or prescribed process, but just one that you can is. bet is probably going to follow within a certain boundary, and that we're kind of uh, in the middle of that boundary, and that the capybaras that came behind us would follow the same path, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's every reason to believe that if we wipe ourselves out, the capybaras will wipe themselves out too, and that goes to inform another thing that I go into in um, the podcast, what's called the Great Filter. This idea that it's possible that there is some barrier between the origin of life growing into intelligent life and that intelligent life spreading out into the universe and that that is why we seem to be alone in the universe because the humans and the capybaras will always inevitably destroy themselves probably because of their intelligence because they gain, uh, as Sagan put it, um, they, they became more powerful before they became wise. And that's a very, wow. that's a precarious position to be in, and that's it's, the position that we're in right now. It's called adolescence. You know that, <laughs> right? Technological adolescence, actually, is what he called it. it precisely, man. Yeah, you the it. energy to act, but without the wisdom to, to, to constrain it. Right. Yeah. So there's a version of what you said, mm -hmm. which uh, surely you know about, because it would have been in that same world of research that you did. Mm -hmm. It has to do with, all right, let's say we want to colonize. That's a bad word today. Settle. 
mm-hmm. another planet. <laughs> show up. <laughs> show, show up. Let's say we want to take a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> vacation. One way vacation. <laughs> right. Pitch tent vacation. and not leave. Right. Permanent Where vacation. we have to yeah. actually build a, a place to live. <laughs> right. All right. To build so, right. so what happens? So right. you go out to the planet. And then, okay. Uh, what's the urge that made you want to do that? Well, it's an urge to like explore, okay? Mm-hmm. Or to conquer. Mm-hmm. Either. It, it's the same effect. Now, there are people there who want to do the same thing. You've bred this into your genetic line mm-hmm. because you you were having babies and you're the one who wanted to do this. Mm-hmm. So then they get two planets. And then they have babies and they get two planets. You go one, two, four, eight, sixteen. Right. It is suggested that you can reach a point where the very urge to explore necessarily is the urge to conquer, Mm. thereby preventing the full exploration of the galaxy. Because you're gonna run into somebody else. You're gonna run into your own people. Your own people. Correct. Right. Correct. Right. And that is a self-limiting arc. Mm -hmm. That's that's the Borg. I mean, you know. But the thing is, is the the great filter in particular, which was um, an economist, a physicist turned economist named Robin Hanson, who I'm sure. No, 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 I don't know. Okay, um, well, Robin Hanson came up with this idea that there's there's something that stops life from expanding out into the planet, and the reason why it would seem to to stop before they they expand out from their planet is because we would see evidence of them otherwise by now. Well, that's that's the the Fermi paradox, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. which is episode one. Well, I, I mean, mm-hmm. I'm telling you, Neil, you would love this Ooh. podcast. It'd be right up your alley. <laughs> Right, another question. All right, Go here we it. go. Let's keep it Gotta be fast because we're almost out of this segment. All right. Let, Why are we what, taking so long to answer these questions? Uh, because, no, it's good. I like All it. Right. You know what I mean? Go. Deep dive. Uh, DJ Maz, 2006 from Instagram says, how do you want to die? Uh, Chuck knows how I want to die because I want to I want to fall into a black hole. That's it. Yes. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, it's a good one. That's totally good. Good Lord. So can I can I follow up with a question, go Chuck? Ahead. Okay. Would you know that you have fallen into a black hole? Would you well, I would know in advance that that's what I want to do, uh-huh. and then I'd fall in, right? And then I would watch what happened and report back until my signal never gets out of the black hole and I get ripped apart. No, but and I think I what Josh spaghetti- is asking is, if you're in the black hole, would it is it is it a process that would allow you some consciousness at a at, at a level where you would be like, oh my well, god, until, you, until seen, you're ripped I'm apart, in the black hole, right. until you're ripped apart, but you're conscious of everything as you fall in, okay. even through the event horizon, even through the event horizon, right. you would still be conscious. Oh yes, yes, oh. and you'll see the whole thing. Wow, totally cool. How about you? Well, I was going to say uh, quickly and painlessly is how I wanted to. Die. That's not imaginative. Come <laughs> right. on, everybody. No, wants but that. just in case there's given what you know, you know about what people don't know, um, give me a better answer than okay, that. Okay, all right, fine, fine. Uh, uh, how do I want to die? I don't know. I think a low energy vacuum bubble would be pretty cool, just washing over us all of a sudden, which would probably be quick and painless oh, too. But then you, it would happen at the speed of light, so you wouldn't right. see it coming. Quick mm-hmm. and painless. That's another quick and painless. Yeah. Whereas a black hole is. Quick but very painful, but deeply fascinating. Because you get spaghetti fired, <laughs> yeah, right? Spaghetti-fied, and you yeah. would feel that. Oh yeah. Okay, that's what I was. Oh, yeah. this hurts so bad, but it's so interesting. Because <laughs> it's science. <laughs> <laughs> All right, when we come back, more Star Talk, Cosmic Queries on the end of the world as we know it. Star Talk is back. I got Josh Clark with me, who is as in a new podcast on the ends of the world. Because he wasn't happy with the billion downloads of stuff you should know, <laughs> he's still at it. So glad to have you on the show. Thank you. So we're we're doing uh, it's a, a Cosmic Queries edition, and Chuck, we spent so much time answering only a few questions. Yes, we got to make this whole segment a lightning round. Wow. Okay, so let's just do it. We have never done this before. The entire, the entire segment, segment will be right, which okay. means that you have to answer the question as concisely as possible. Yeah, in a sound bite, yeah, basically. Pretty much Practice in, your sound bites. In a sound bite, okay? Right. If you don't sound bite, I will sound bite you. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> go. <laughs> okay, go, here we go. Nico Black 247 on Instagram says, uh, when we find life off the, the earth, would you expect, how would you expect religious groups to react? Would they change? Thanks from Illinois. All right, go. They would freak out, I think. Some religious groups would freak out because life on Earth, human life on Earth, intelligent human life on Earth is the believed to be the sole creation of God. But so many other religious groups will be totally down with it and just see it as a greater part of God's creation. Hmm. All right, bing, bing, yeah. let's move on. This is Liam Beckett on Instagram who says this. Um, do you think as a society we will ever get past biased 
news from both sides or only become more divided, speaking of the end of the world. <laughs> yeah, totally. I think this is just kind of like a, a temporary problem that we have, and we are going to continue to advance. And as we advance, we will be less divided. I, I, that's my hope, at least. Neil? That was beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. That was unrealistically beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> really? You think so? Oh, this is just a phase we're going through. It's not, really? the, it's not the beginning of the end of civilization. Um, <laughs> my, my issue is people try to beat each other on the head to convince them of your own opinion and try to get you to vote in ways that align with their opinion when there's so much, so many things out there that are objectively true that we should all agree on what is objectively true and then base civilization on that. And then mm -hmm. after that, celebrate each other's diverse opinions rather than beat each other to, over the head for them being different. But I think that's a point that we're, we're, we can conceivably get to, and when we do, we will be less divided. So really, you just said the same thing I did. Oh, snap! <laughs> oh, all right, time to move Ooh, on. Snap! <laughs> uh, all right, next question. Uh, this is Francesco Sante says, as long as humans have existed, I assume we have looked up and felt a connection with the universe, even if we didn't have the insights of astrophysics and cosmology. Do our atoms know? All caps. That they came from up there? No. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Next no, question. No, no. So, so John Kennedy, I think before President Kennedy, before he was president, as you may know, he uh, they have a uh, home a home in Hyannisport. Right. right. So the ocean coastline is not unfamiliar to him. They own boats. This sort of thing. He spoke often about the allure of the ocean and wondered openly whether we are drawn to the ocean shore because our genetic profile may remember that in fact we came from our it. vertebrate history is owed to the fishes in the sea hmm. and that we're somehow pulled back to it. So I can, I can poetically agree with that, but there is no way we could have known that we are stardust without modern astrophysics telling us this. I think we will look up and wonder, but I don't think it's because there's a genetic connection. I think it's because we just want to know if someone up there is going to eat us. <laughs> <laughs> that looks dangerous. We're looking, we're, we're looking up at the universe the way you look in the brush. Is something there going to harm me? Hmm. If it's not, then otherwise it's a beautiful thing to look at. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. All right, next. Uh, Alejandra Hernandez, once from Twitter, says this. With some AI nearly capable of passing the Turing test, do you believe the technological singularity will occur in the near future? And if so, how do you think humanity will fare? Now, we touched upon that in the mm -hmm. in So let me beginning. sharpen that question. How, uh, yeah. Here it is. Okay. How soon is this going to happen? There you go. Oh, <laughs> man, I don't know. Um, uh, the, how close? How, how, how thing soon will AI me, be our overlords? The thing that, that <laughs> I find upsetting and scary is um, that it Says could the man happen. who has an end of the world podcast. <laughs> he that, says, <laughs> what I find scary. Right. <laughs> I'm afraid it, now. It could happen at any time, conceivably. It could happen at any time. From what I understand, we have all the components out there, and it could just kind of happen. They could fall into place. I don't know. It, it's impossible to predict when it will happen. And you can't say with absolute certainty that it will happen. Mm -hmm. It's just really possible. And the fact that it is possible means that it could conceivably happen at any time. And is the self is I'm sorry, is the singularity, this is my question, so we're still in our, our uh, lightning round, is the singularity actual consciousness or is it self-aware? So the singularity is this point where machines become self-aware and super intelligent. Or if you're a transhumanist, that's the point where we I merge with uh, a transhumanist. Yeah, what is that? So that's a big, big umbrella term, and it um, it encompasses a lot of different thoughts and philosophies, but the main thing that threads it all together is this idea that we can and will and should merge, merge. with our machines, merge with right. our technology, which sounds far out until you well, realize- We're already like, doing it. Yeah, we wear like glasses and contacts yeah. and clothes and stuff like that. To and I carry the world bodies. internet in my pocket. Yes, exactly. Now I don't have to graft it into my cerebellum. Okay, but wouldn't it be easier and more convenient if you did just kind of get uh, information that rapidly, that okay, easily- so could Wait a minute. Open, open skull surgery or pull this out of my pocket. Is that my choice? Basically. 
I, I don't need to see the latest cat video that badly. <laughs> right. I can wait until I can dial it up on my on my phone. But what about an infinite loop of cat video? <laughs> what about that? Let me sweeten the pot a little. Next bit. Next question. Oh, All right. right. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Uh, Rex Young, you almost touched on this, but from Twitter says this. Rex wants to know any general advice on how to foster peace in the world, locally, online, or in the world at large. How do we foster uh, and foment peace? I'm glad this so, a great so that question, would then man. preclude, if you succeed at that, that means total worldwide warfare is off the table as an existential risk. So yeah. that's an important question. Right. Right. So, yeah, I think that um, that seems to be found in the organizations and the um, institutions that we build. Um, from what I understand, the, the, the moral progress of humanity has been kind of tied to the, um, the, the, the global community that we've been developing. And as we spread out and, and understand and meet more and more people and connect with more and more people, that seems to be in lockstep with, with this, this movement toward peace on a global okay. scale. He's so hopeful. Oh I really gosh. am hopeful. I, I, I'm deeply hopeful Man. for the future of humanity. I'm also worried, but I am hopeful for sure. Wow. That's, that's really cool. That's that's so beautiful. It is. Thank you. Yeah. I'm I a feel, comedian. I mean, I wish so I was that. Pretty. I'm not that hopeful. If I were that hopeful, I'd be unemployed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I still give us. <laughs> I still give us a very low chance of making it to technological maturity and safety. But I'm I, I am deeply hopeful that we will, and that if we do reach that, that uh, there will be uh, a much more peaceful. Uh, species that we are. All right, cool. I don't know how much time we Keep have. Keep going. But, Just do uh, it. Do it. This is uh, Fyodor po Popov. Mm. Fyodor? What? Fyodor. 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 But not Theodor. Fyodor. Fyodor. The, Fyodor. That's the original version. <laughs> <laughs> here, here we go. What do you think are the best ways to keep abreast of current developments in the study of existential risk? There are great websites out there, like those of Future Humanity Institute and Future of Life Institute. Neither is very active on social media. Have you ever specifically researched the various topics you've explored uh, since you finished the series? Yeah, actually, great question. Go so, for it. so a couple of things. I'm I'm planning on doing a follow up to the 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 end of the world podcast these first 10 episodes that's a lot more podcasty a weekly kind of thing to keep abreast of all this stuff so listen out for that but um also the future of life institute actually is pretty pretty um pretty visible on social media they have a great podcast as well but that that's a really important point right now as far as existential risks are concerned um, there's a, a lot of academics writing really smart papers and you have to go grind those up to understand what's going on. So that's one of the reasons I'm why an academic, we read the papers, right? Don't grind them up. Well, but, I'm a non-academic. If you're non-academic, grind you grind. Just, that's and exactly you can use right. them as, uh, you grind, you no, no, go, just oh, in, in all fairness, academic research papers are very dry right. and very jargon filled yep. and they're, they're really hard getting You have to teach yourself how to read yeah. an academic paper. So yeah. it is a grind for people like us, yes, right? Yes, it is. Um, so that's why I made this podcast and that's why I, I plan to continue to make the podcast mm -hmm. because I will grind the stuff up and then try to explain it so that it's not just academic You'll be our conduit to our extinction. That would, be, that, that would be great. If we're going to go extinct either way, I might. You, want to, be that, be you don't want to be the guy. Right. right. I get bored, so you don't have to. There you go. All right, here we go. I got uh, another one, I think. Yeah, yeah go. I got another one. Here's this one. Uh, this is Mar Mario Gert. <laughs> Mario Gert on Instagram says, is it possible that our universe is someone else's large hadron collider? Oh, that's a good one. What an awesome little question. I mean, are we the galaxy on the belt of Orion? Right. There you go. Did you get that reference? No. Mm. Men in Black. Men in Black. Uh, the first one? Yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen it in a while. <laughs> okay. Okay. I love Josh. <laughs> I freaking love him. <laughs> I'm feeling it. You, no, no. You, you have, you have um, incomplete geek street cred. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I know. There's it's, gaps. It's true. There's there's there. things that I need to learn. There's some gaps for sure. Some gaps. That's okay. We still love you. <laughs> so let me answer that in a slightly different way. Okay. When we first probed the atom and we found, oh wait a minute, the atom has a nucleus and it's got electrons that orbit the nucleus. That's just like the solar system. Mm -hmm. The solar system is just like the galaxy mm -hmm. with stars orbiting the center of the galaxy. We have planets orbiting a star, and we have electrons orbiting. So maybe it's that all the way down. Right. Maybe that's the theme, and maybe that's how all this works. Mm -hmm. And when you start probing the atom on that scale, mm -hmm. 
the laws of physics manifest in completely different ways. Right. So it's not just a scaling phenomenon. Right. So for us to have these laws of physics manifest the way that we do and claim that it's the microscopic physics in someone else's collider, it's just not a realistic extension of how things work. Right. Mm. Although it was deeply attractive because it, it, it was philosophically pleasing mm -hmm. right. to imagine that you just had nested. Of course, because it's very like nesting linear. Dolls. It's, it's, it's yeah. just nesting, it's yeah, just, you just keep dolls. going. Mm -hmm. right. so, um, so because things manifest differently on these scales, mm -hmm. you can't just get, for example, okay? Um, there's a, something called a water strider which is a, mm. an insect that can right, just dry on the water. On the water. Yeah, it, 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 the surface tension it, it uses the water. surface tension of the water. If that were any bigger, it would just fall through. You can't, you, you can't scale things mm -hmm. because the forces operating have different manifestations on different scales. Right. That's why. And so that's why, uh, what, what's the movie Them? Remember the movie, I don't know them? the movie Them? With the ants? Ants! Oh, he's got one! I have seen that he's one. He's got one! It's all them. Giant ants. I, the, I might have been some nuclear thing and the ants got big. Nice. And the ants are coming. Okay, ants are creepy anyway, and now they're bigger than you. Yeah. You freak out. I love ants. That can never happen. Do you love ants? I love them so much. Because ants have these <clears throat> tiny, spindly little legs. Right. And if you scale up the size of the ant, its weight outstrips the ability of these spindly legs to hold them up. Have you done this on Twitter? Have you have you done a Twitter rant about? I them? could I could totally rant on this. <laughs> uh, so the point is, as you get bigger, I can say this mathematically. Right. As you get bigger, the strength of your legs, your limbs, only goes up as the cross sectional area, but your weight goes up as the cube of your dimensions. Ooh. So what happens is, because as you get bigger, you grow in all dimensions, mm -hmm. but your and legs, if, if your leg gets wider, the strength is only the cross section of your leg. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, the so cross eventually you just crush You crush. Yourself. That's why hippopotami don't have skinny legs. Right. <laughs> and they're, they're short, fat, they're stumpy short, legs. Fat, stumpy, stumpy, stumpy legs. <laughs> like elephants have stumpy legs. Right. Okay? That's a giraffe has long slender legs, but a giraffe does not don't weigh all that much. Right. It's slender. And the, and the distribution is not The distribution is completely anyway, different. Like, yeah. so, it's, so it's a fascinating cottage industry yeah. studying the relationship between size and life. And how mm -hmm. things scale. And how things scale. Wow. Yeah, I do. And that wasn't a lightning round, no, but who cares? Yeah. That was no, really no. cool, man. No, and it's why if you take a bucket of water and empty it on your car, it doesn't stay as a big ball of water. Mm -hmm. But if they make the water smaller and smaller and smaller, it just becomes droplets. Then it's a drop, and the drop will stay on the mm -hmm. curve because yeah, right. surface tension holds it. Exactly. Surface tension is not strong enough to hold big things, it'll hold a little thing. Right. The world of insects is completely surface driven. The, the, their physics courses in Insects 101 is all about surface tension. Huh. Right. Yeah. Because they you can get trapped inside of a little bubble. Mm hmm. How do I get out with well, surface tension? <laughs> okay. That's why everyone needs to know physics. Everybody needs, insects, even the insects. humans, everybody. Oh, wow, that was cool. We gotta wrap this cool. up. That was cool, that was cool. Okay. We gotta wrap this. Oh, we're done. Dude, yeah, yeah, oh, sorry. Man, I was trying to go back to we, another one. We did get a bunch in there, though. Yeah, we did. Yeah, Listen, yeah. That, was the, that was like the longest lightning round we've ever yeah, had. That was yeah, cool. no, it was good, good, good. So, Josh, thanks for thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for we having We gotta do me. this again. I will do it anytime you want. Anytime. That I will I, walk up here for this. Uh, from, where do you live? Uh, down in Atlanta. Atlanta. He will walk in from Atlanta. <laughs> gonna, when he said down, I thought he was going to say down in the village. Yeah, downtown. Yeah, you know, down from Atlanta. Just before we sign off, tell us exactly where to find your work. Oh, uh, you can find The End of the World with Josh Clark anywhere you find podcasts, including the iHeartRadio app and Apple Podcasts and all that jam. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can find me on social media at Josh Um Clark. I don't know if you noticed or not, but I say um quite a bit. Um, and I started a hashtag to keep a, a conversation about existential risk going. It's hashtag EOTW Josh Clark. So people can find me those ways. Awesome. All right. If you're looking for the end of the world, this is your man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, dude, thanks for being on Star Thank Talk. you very much for having Chuck, me. Chuck, always good to have you. Oh, are you kidding me? It's my pleasure. All right. You've been listening to, possibly even watching, Star Talk. End of the world as you know it edition. <laughs> Cosmic Queries. Josh Clark, thanks for being on. Thank you. As always, I bid you to keep looking up. <laughs>